Welcome back, everybody, to the Club Metaverse podcast. I am Mark Fernandez, and I am joined once again by one of your favorite guests that I've had on, the great Dr. Professor Avi Loeb of Harvard University. How are you today, doctor? I'm doing great. Thank you. Cool. You've been in the news a lot recently, and, and, and I know that I'd be remiss. We have quite a bit to talk about. You have a new book, a follow-up to Extraterrestrial called uh, Interstellar, but you've also been in the news quite a bit uh, recently uh, because of your um, expedition to Papua New Guinea, which, first of all, sounds, you know, sounds amazing. As somebody who has, uh, who followed very closely uh, James Cameron's uh, uh, Deep Sea Challenger, a lot of his, you know, uh, work was done off the coast of Papua New Guinea because there's quite a few incredible trenches that happen right off the coast. And it's, you know, to me, it's amazing that you guys uh, were able to, A, uh, track this one uh, meteor, I believe it's called 1M1, um, from, uh, to, to distinguish that this meteor had faster speed than most meteors that enter the Earth's atmosphere. And that here, 10 years later, right, because that happened in 2014, that you're able to recognize this one meteor and know exactly the vicinity of where it landed and then launch an expedition to go find it. So can you tell me a little bit about how that project sort of came about? Yeah, um, it was the, uh, the period that I regard as the most thrilling in my scientific career, uh, this expedition. And in fact, the person who coordinated the expedition with me uh, worked with uh, Jim Cameron uh, oh. before, and uh, his name is Rob McCallum. Oh, of course. For... Um, and the... Uh, it all started with the government, the U.S. government, uh, reporting a meteor back on January 8th, 2014, um, and measuring the speed that it moved. They, they detected the fireball. They're monitoring the Earth for national security purposes, and every now and then they notice a meteor. This one uh, released a few percent of the uh, Hiroshima atomic bomb energy, and uh, it exploded about uh, 20 kilometers uh, over the Pacific Ocean uh, um, surface and uh, about uh, 90 kilometers away from Papua New Guinea. Uh, and uh, what was unusual about it is that it, this meteor moved very fast. And mm. uh, with my student, uh, Amir Siraj, we realized, in fact, it was unbound to the sun. It was moving mm. faster than the escape speed from the solar system. And we extrapolated and found that outside the solar system, it was moving at 60 kilometers per second, uh, which is faster than 95% uh, of the stars in the vicinity of the sun. Hmm. Uh, moreover, the fireball data implied that this object was extremely tough in material strength because it survived all the way down to the lower atmosphere of the Earth. And uh, it was tougher than all other meteors recorded by NASA over the past decade, 272 of them. So uh, if, even if it's natural, uh, it must have uh, originated in some unusual natural process uh, that made it tougher than all the space rocks that we are familiar with. But there is also the possibility that it's a uh, technological object, and that's why it's tough, because it's made of some artificial alloy, like uh, steel that we are producing. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was moving fast simply because it had additional propulsion. Um, and to find this out, uh, we decided to go on an expedition. As soon as uh, the U.S. government released a letter from the Department of Defense to NASA confirming our finding at the 99.999% that this object indeed came from interstellar space, uh, we decided to go and find any relics from it, any fragments from it. And it's a very challenging task because... The depth of the ocean is two kilometers. Mm. Uh, we are talking about the molten droplets from the surface of the object when the surface was exposed to the fireball uh, and heated up and melted. Uh, these droplets are roughly a millimeter in size, the size of the head of a pin. And finding them across a region of 10 kilometers in size uh, is very challenging, daunting. And I thought we might not find anything. Uh, so to do the job, we built a sled that um, we connected with a cable to a winch on the deck of the ship that we rented. And the, the ship was fittingly called the Silver Star. <laughs> and, um, and, and we covered both sides of this sled with magnets. 
And when we went there and, um, uh, if, you know, we uh, at first noticed that the sled um, is not is flying above the surface. It's not really on the surface because it didn't collect anything. Mm -hmm. And the reason was that the cable connecting it to the ship was bringing it up. It had the... Uh, a, a, a tension that counteracted gravity that pulled the sled up and uh, the reason for that was that the current that the boat was respond, uh, responding to is different than the current uh, under at, at near the, this, the bottom of the ocean and so sure. there was tension building up between the sled and, and, the, and the ship and uh, we managed to solve this problem by moving along with the current and mm. the, uh, the engineers on the ship um, really found a, an amazing uh, method to do that and it worked. After a couple of days, we were able to have the sled lie on the surface and collect, um, uh, you know, uh, material, most of which was black powder. So when it was on um, you know, there is a lot of volcanic activity at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, uh, and uh, we saw this uh, black da dust particles uh, uh, that are magnetic. They attach to the magnets. As we scooped the magnets, we saw mostly that. And that was true in control regions far away from where the meteor uh, mm. was expected to be located. We localized it uh, quite well beyond uh, what the U.S. government uh, data implied the, using seismometer data from Manus Island in Papua New Guinea, we could figure out how far away the meteor exploded based on the blast wave that it generated. There was a recording of the sound after some time delay. And mm -hmm. from that time delay, we could tell where the meteor exploded. And we went there. And uh, so at first we thought, oh, we're just collecting this uh, black powder. Uh, we haven't yet found any, any materials from the meteor. But then uh, we dried it up and we used the mesh to filter out the tiny uh, volcanic ash particles. And uh, uh, whatever was left, you know, had a size bigger than a quarter of a millimeter, which was the mesh size, the size of the holes in the mesh. Mm. And um, we looked at it through a microscope and it was already a week into the expedition. And then the breakthrough came when we noticed in the microscope images we noticed these uh, uh, beautiful metallic marbles uh, yeah. that are roughly half a millimeter in size. And these are the spherules left over from the meteor, basically molten droplets of metal uh, that uh, fell like rain on the ocean and sank to the, uh, the bottom of the ocean and uh, at a depth of two kilometers uh, almost a decade ago. Mm -hmm. And they were sitting there for almost a decade until we picked them up with our magnets. And we were very lucky, I should say, because if uh, along uh, one of the lines, we basically used a sled that has a width of a meter or so, mm -hmm. uh, and then we dragged it uh, along a distance of uh, 10 kilometers. That was the size of the region that we were serving, crisscrossing. And, um, and so uh, we were lucky because along one of the lines that, uh, was going in the direction of the meteor path, we found 10 spherules. Mm -hmm. And if this meteor was half its size, we would barely find one spherule. And uh, that is roughly the level of the background. When we went away to large distances from that location, we would find one or two. Uh, but at the meteor site, we found 10 when mm -hmm. we were close to the meteor path. And, and that stood out. And uh, if the meteor was smaller, half its size, then it would have uh, eight times less mass. And then we would end up with one spheroid, which we would not distinguish relative to the background. So, so nature was very kind to us that it provided enough spherules along the sled uh, path in, in one line uh, so that uh, we could notice that they belong to the meteor. And uh, and I was thrilled when we found that. And now the task is to examine the composition of these sure. spherules. And uh, first of all, figure out that uh, whether they, they're made of materials that are different from uh, solar system rocks uh, in terms of the elements that make them. But also we could potentially date the age of mm. the 
of this object and the, the duration of the journey uh, based on radioactive uh, isotopes that we find in it. Uh, and that is of great value. First, the age can tell us that it may have uh, been uh, longer lived than uh, the solar system was. So it, it was traveling for billions of years. And mm. uh, perhaps we learn something about its uh, point of origin. Uh, and, and then the next uh, question is whether it was a natural rock that was produced in some unusual uh, environment different than the solar system, or whether it's artificial in origin. Uh, sure. So just to give you an example, if we end up finding um, uh, elements that make up, for example, semiconductors, you know, or, or electronic circuits mm. uh, that would be uh, indicative of a technological origin. Uh, we don't know. We, we still have to do the work in the coming weeks. And um, um, altogether, it's uh, very exciting because it's the first time that humans put their hands on material that made up an, a big object. Um, at least uh, half a meter in size that came from outside the solar system. And, and that's uh, a completely new window into the universe, uh, a new frontier in astronomy, because in the past, astronomers used telescopes to look at what lies outside the solar system. Sure. And here we're using microscopes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, so, so I have a couple questions, because um, in 2017, of course, with Oumuamua, it was kind of like the scientific community's acceptance that this was the first interstellar object that we had tracked in our solar system. Now, this being uh, something that happened in 2014, is there a, a kind of an equivalent to what on Earth we call terminal velocity, right? Where there's only X amount of speed that an object can fall before the resistance of wind and and all other kinds of variables keep it at a certain speed is there the equivalent of terminal velocity in space that that there's resistance from the gravity in the sun and the planets and such that prevent objects from going beyond a certain speed because if if i remember correctly uh this particular meteor was traveling at around 130,000 miles per hour is that what percentage faster is that than the kind of common um, meteor that does fly within the confines of our solar system? Well, in interstellar space, there is not much resistance. The density of, of uh, the medium that fills mm -hmm. up interstellar space is, is extremely low. Um, so, in fact, in principle, you can have objects moving up to the speed of light. Uh, they will not be slowed down significantly if they are sufficiently massive. And uh, um, I mean, obviously, things colliding with them could damage them, mm -hmm. uh, but um, uh, there is not much slowing down as a result of the interstellar medium. Of course, the Earth has an atmosphere, and as you noted, indeed, it's very dense, and objects eventually slow down, but only in the lower atmosphere of the Earth. Mm -hmm. uh, before that, um, again, the resistance is not significant. Uh, so... Um, uh, this object, the meteor in particular, was uh, moving at uh, 60 kilometers per second outside the solar system, faster than 95% of all stars in the vicinity of the sun. Um, and that is uh, roughly one part in 10,000 or, or actually 5,000 of the speed of light. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's still a relatively small speed relative to the speed of light, but um, it's faster than... Uh, typical meteors that we see from the solar system. And in, in the case of this meteor, it actually came from behind the Earth as the Earth moves around the sun. You know, it came from behind the Earth. If it were to collide with the Earth uh, in a frontal collision where the Earth moves uh, opposite to its direction, Ooh, its, speed, its speed would have been 90 kilometers per second relative to Earth. So, um, right. yeah, so at any event, uh, so... What we noticed is this uh, speed of the object was faster than the escape speed from the solar system. That's what the most important thing that indicates that it came from out far away, uh, that it was not bound to the sun. All the other rocks that we often see are bound to the sun. They are made out of debris that uh, was left from the formation process of the sun. Um, and um, so in that sense, it's the first object uh, almost four years before Oumuamua, 
that was recognized as coming from outside the solar system. Oumuamua did not collide with Earth. It, it just sure. passed near Earth within a distance of roughly a, a, a fifth of the Earth-Sun separation. But this object was much smaller. Oumuamua was a, roughly the size of a football field and uh, 100, 200 meters. And this one was half a meter roughly in size based on the fireball that it created. And, um, and so it's almost 200 times smaller. Uh, and then the question is, um, you know, how come we could detect it? Well, it's because it created a fireball in the Earth's atmosphere. So mm. uh, whereas in the case of Oumuamua, we just noticed the reflection of sunlight. That's why we cannot actually see objects that are meter size based on the reflection of sunlight at the distance that Oumuamua was noticed. There must be many of them passing by that we don't notice. So only those colliding with Earth are being noticed. And they, such a, an interstellar object colliding with Earth uh, with a size of roughly a meter, uh, that happens once a decade. Okay, so, so it's a rare event, but we knew that it, um, it is out there based on government data and we went to get it. And, and based on this kind of threshold, of you know breaking the kind of solar system speed limit as it were have you been able to sort of backtrack and find other instances of other objects that have entered the earth's atmosphere that also exceed this kind yeah. of planet uh, you know solar system yeah limit? there is a there is a second uh, interstellar meteor that we identified it collided with earth in march 2017 uh, about the uh, seven months before Oumuamua was identified. So both mm. of them, both meteors. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually checked. It's an interesting coincidence. I checked whether it's related, the second one, to Oumuamua, because it had roughly the same uh, distance of closest approach to the sun. And, oh, wow. Uh, and roughly the same speed also when it came close to the sun. But turned out that it came from a different direction. Because I was thinking maybe it was a piece that was broken off. Sure, uh, Oumuamua, or maybe Oumuamua released uh, uh, some dandelion seeds. <laughs> uh, probes, exactly. but, uh, yeah. but it ended up not being from the same direction, so it, they are not related. Um, so um, we have a second candidate that we might uh, go on an expedition to find. Um, mm. It was uh, between Portugal and uh, the Azores, and uh, mm. we are thinking about um, uh, going there and collecting its own uh, fragments. Uh, but the key about finding the spherules uh, that we currently have, more than 50 of them, is mm. not only in terms of figuring out the material composition, the dating, the age of the object, how long it's spent in its journey and so forth, but also because they are just like uh, rose petals uh, leading us to our partner in a romantic sense because there might be a large piece lying on the ocean floor. Mm. Uh, from the meteor. And of course, if we find it, and that is the plan, and we are planning the next expedition to go after that piece using sonar, a different way of finding it. Uh, we will image the ocean floor, look for objects that are different than rocks. Um, and uh, if we find it, it will be clear whether it's an interstellar rock or uh, some technological artifact. And uh, I asked the students in my class at Harvard in the spring semester, in the last class, I asked them, well, if we find a technological gadget <laughs> and it has buttons on it, should we press a button? And uh, half of the class said, uh, no, you should not do that because who knows what would happen. Sure. Uh, the other half said, yes, that would be very exciting to figure out what it does. And then one of the students asked me, what will I do? And I said, uh, I would bring it to a laboratory before engaging with it. I want to figure right. out what its uh, functions are. Which, which is what you're doing now. So one, one thing that um, fascinates me about this particular, um, you know, ongoing expedition that you're on is, you know, when you hear somebody like Elon Musk, who, who obviously, you know, is, uh, you know, um, the CEO of SpaceX and highly involved in this, and they ask him, about all these UFO phenomena that are currently happening. He always kind of talks about one thing, which is that he's never seen a metal, like, logical uh, uh, alloy that's not made by humans, right? Like that yeah. once he can see the composition of a metal alloy, 
that is beyond our understanding of technology, then he'll start to listen. Is this, and this is exactly what you're looking for in these ferals is to understand, is this alloy something that we're familiar with or something uh, that we're not? And what is that sort of delta between familiarity and non-familiarity when you're looking at an alloy? Well, um, it's um, the, the concentration of various elements, you know, that uh, especially rare elements that often you do not see at the large quantities or the absence of some elements that are common in rocks. Mm. And, and so we want to distinguish it from solar system objects, uh, but also from human made objects. Um, and see whether we notice anything. And if we find uh, a big uh, rem remnant of the original meteor, we could learn much more, of course. Now, um, the one thing uh, that strikes me is since the days of uh, Enrico Fermi's statement, you know, mm -hmm. 70 years ago, he said, where is everybody? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's just like um, a, a single person staying at home and saying, well, I don't have any partner next to me. Where, where is everybody? And right. obviously to find partners, you have to go to dating sites. You have to search. <laughs> you have to put some effort because otherwise the self-fulfilling prophecy, it will not fall into your lap. Good and point. the same applies to finding evidence for extraterrestrial technological uh, probes or devices. Uh, it will not fall into our laps. We have to go out and search for them. And this object that we went after was the first one that came from interstellar space. And uh, all I'm telling uh, uh, Elon, and my advice is, um, you know, in order to find something, you should search for it. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he, just by looking at space around the orbit of the Earth and near the sun, you know, he's exploring a very tiny region um, which is a, a quadrillion times smaller than the size of the observable universe. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just like um, imagining an ant um, serving the head of a pin and making a statement about um, the most distant planet. That's sure. roughly the, the, the ratio of scales. Uh, it's a very presumptuous ant to claim what what they lies at the edge of the solar system based on the survey of a head of a pin. Mm -hmm. And so when Elon says, I've not seen anything, well, first of all, he didn't really search. And second, the, the volume that he is looking at is tiny. And um, so I think, uh, you know, it's much more extraordinary to claim that we are uh, unique, alone, uh, because we see that there are billions of stars like the sun in the Milky Way galaxy, tens of billions actually, and most of them formed billions of years before the sun. And it takes half a billion years for chemical rockets of the type that we produce to traverse the Milky Way galaxy. So it's a completely reasonable thing for us to check our backyard. You know, we find rocks very often, but uh, maybe there is a tennis ball that was thrown by a neighbor. And uh, I think it's very reasonable to look for that because we sent out five probes to interstellar space, uh, Voyager 1, Voyager 2, Pioneer yeah. 10, Pioneer 11, and the New Horizons. So uh, here is the first interstellar object. It had material strength different than solar system rocks. That's intriguing. You know, at the very least, we learn something about natural objects outside the solar system, but we might also be surprised. And Oumuamua was this, another one, um, and it also looked strange. It had some unusual shape. It was flat and was mm. pushed away from the sun without showing a cometary tail. So all I'm saying is we should be intrigued by this rather than, uh, uh, you know, ignore the evidence and say we know the answer in advance. And just to give you an example, um, when we came back from the expedition on the same day, uh, I was notified that, that there is a paper posted uh, that was published uh, by an expert on meteors. Mm -hmm. And in that paper, the expert says, you know, we tried to use our model for solar system rocks uh, to fit the data from the U.S. government on this meteor from 2014. And it didn't match. And therefore, the data must be wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is after the U.S. government, the Department of Defense, released a letter a year ago to NASA uh, stating that at the 99.999%, they are confident that this object is interstellar. So he's saying, I don't care what you say in your letter. Your data does not fit my model. Therefore, your data is wrong. That's mm -hmm. a very arrogant perspective because if yeah. 
if a model doesn't fit data, the first thing to think about is modifying the model. Why sure. would the model applying to solar system rocks apply to objects coming from outside the solar system? Uh, and moreover, this paper concludes that um, the object, uh, this, the, this meteor, was uh, most likely not made of iron. Well, mm -hmm. we came from the site of the meteor, we collected the spherules, and the one thing we noticed immediately by studying their composition is that it, it, these spherules are mostly made of iron. So, mm. I, I, you know, it's a sign of arrogance yeah. uh, to, to make these statements. Uh, and I think the biggest message we get from the universe is stay humble. You know, mm. We don't know much. We know that most of the matter in the universe, 83% of the matter in the universe, is of a substance that we've never detected in the solar system. Sure. It's called dark matter. So why should we assume that objects entering the solar system must be of the same type as the objects that we found in the yeah. solar system in the past? You know, what, one thing that I've heard you speak of before, and I, I respect you greatly for it, is this idea of open science versus classified science. And with all of this uh, news coming out of whistleblowers and UFOs and videos of TikToks and all of this stuff, um, has have you been approached as one of the leading sort of, you know, not only, you know, one of the leading physicists in America's number one educational institution, but as, you know, who you are in all of your experiments and your books and your knowledge, have you been approached by the government to talk about these classified findings and, and to try to understand um, what they actually have? Or, or is that no. something that you, you, you haven't? No, I was not. And, you know, you can interpret that in, in two ways. Either they want to keep it classified. And I prefer not to sign an, sign an NDA because if I do find something through the standard scientific uh, process, uh, you know, I don't, want to have any issue with uh, the legal system uh, because uh, sure. if I know something else, then people might say, oh, that knowledge influenced what you report as a scientist. And uh, the way I'm operating now is I don't know much about anything classified and therefore, you know, whatever I find scientifically will be open to the public. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other possible interpretation is that the government doesn't have it. Right, okay. right. So, That's what I'm leading uh, towards, to be honest with you. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there was this uh, whistleblower. He uh, mentioned, uh, David Grush mentioned uh, other people telling him about very exciting things that the government has. But this is hearsay. Mm -hmm. And he himself did not see it. Uh, it's possible that other people were talking about things that do not exist. I mean, people can say whatever they want. The, the question is, is there something behind those statements? And mm -hmm. of course, at some point, maybe the government will release uh, information about what they have, but I haven't seen it. Yeah. Um, do you think this is going to be a little bit far out there? But, you know, given the fact that, you know, the Earth and humanity has been around for about a third of the existence of the universe, and I know you and I spoke a little bit about this last time, um, do you think that, you know, since it took about four and a half billion years to make our level of civilization, that it's possible that there's another civilization that has been able to sort of get past all of the incredible hurdles of the reality of physics, the reality of distance, the reality of the speed limit of the speed of light. Or do you think it's possible that maybe it's humans in the future that have found a way to manipulate time and come back to where we are now? Oh, no, there is no need to invent uh, new physics. Uh, we know that uh, most, well, the laws of physics as we know them right now, you know, they apply everywhere. They're not like yeah. the legal system in our society <laughs> where people can violate the law. Uh, there is no, no constituent of the universe that violates, uh, as far as we know so far, the speed limit of the speed of light. Mm -hmm. Of course, we might be surprised in the future to find something like that, but so far, no hint of that. So um, quantum mechanics have been um, holding uh, uh, very strong and uh, describing everything we know about uh, over the past century. And uh, finding new physics is a really rare thing nowadays. Um, um, so... Uh, I would hesitate to break one of the fundamental principles of physics and say, well, maybe they did it. 
but uh, you don't need to because most stars from billions of years before the sun and uh, all you need is to allow for technology as we know it based on the laws of physics to develop for much longer than we developed it we developed it only over a century the modern sure. science and technology and if you just allow us uh, a few more centuries you know obviously right yeah, yeah. now uh, artificial intelligence ai is exponential it's exponential the growth yeah exactly and so what we might see is our technological future uh, coming from another civilization that preceded us that's the most natural thing and it will not be biologic an encounter with biological creatures like you find in science fiction books it will be more uh, with uh, technological gadgets that have uh, artificial intelligence and they could be much more resilient to the hazardous conditions of mm. interstellar travel and that's what i imagine and uh, of course to figure them out they, it would take us a while they don't need to communicate with whoever sent them and it's possible that the senders are dead by now it's quite likely actually mm -hmm. given the journey time that could be hundreds of millions of years and then um, uh, and so the advantage for finding for us finding it, uh, them is of course that we can learn about new technologies uh, we can learn from uh, uh, a smarter more intelligent uh, kid in our class of uh, intelligent civilizations within the Milky Way. So I think more of it is an opportunity for us to grow and also to get a better perspective about uh, our ambitions in space, uh, what we might accomplish based on what they accomplish, because they arrived to us before we arrived to them, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, that already tells you that they're more advanced than we are. And uh, again, it's a sign of modesty that, uh, we will be willing to learn from them, you know, and so far, everyone that claims I haven't seen any evidence and I don't think, you know, we are most likely alone and it's extraordinary to even claim that we are not alone. You know, that's a very arrogant point of view, which is mm -hmm. held by most most of the scientific community. And I find that to be exactly opposite of to where we should be. We should say, no, we are not special. You know, humans... Uh, just uh, came to exist a few million years ago. Now, even Mars, you know, Mars had very similar conditions to Earth, okay? Sure. And it lost its, it lost its atmosphere at, at the middle of its lifespan, uh, about two billion years ago. And uh, before that, it had the uh, ocean, uh, uh, oceans and, and, and rivers of liquid water and possibly life as we know it here on Earth. I mean, it wouldn't be crazy to imagine that. Uh, but you might say, okay, well, suppose Mars developed intelligent life twice as fast as Earth did. Mm -hmm. That's also possible. It's just a factor of two in the speed of development in the history. Sure. And if, that, if that happened on Mars, you know, uh, more than two billion years ago, if there was some intelligence there, uh, then it preceded us humans here on, on Earth. And um, one thing that I'm very curious about is there are these caves on Mars that they are called lava tubes that mm. are created when uh, there is a lava flow and the top of the flow uh, develops a crust while under that crust, the flow continues. So you end up with uh, a cave. And we found, find those in Hawaii, for example, mm -hmm. they're very common. So um, both the moon and uh, Mars are known to have lava tubes. And what I'm curious about is to go into these and, check, and check the walls, whether they have any paintings, prehistoric right. paintings. Right. Uh, you know, that was never done. Uh, obviously, it will, you know, there might also be some relics of living organisms or animals or even intelligent animals that That's may have existed on Mars. And of course, they perished when Mars lost its atmosphere and the, uh, all the liquid water dried up. Um, but these are places where you can find evidence for early life on Mars. So I would not be surprised if Mars had some uh, things on it that are not very far from what Earth has right now, but earlier. And in fact, it's possible that life on Earth uh, was triggered by life on Mars because we know frogs that made their way from Mars to the Earth and mm -hmm. they could have uh, seeded the Earth with life. So we might all be Martians. And when Elon Musk says <laughs> he wants to die on, on, on Mars, well, he, he, he dreams of dying there. It's just like dreaming of dying, you know, if, if life indeed started over there, like 
you you're dreaming of dying uh, at your parents home kind right. of right Uh, like a but, like a like a like a like a sea turtle. So one one question because I know we're running out of time and I and you've been very gracious and generous with your time and I appreciate that. You have a new book, um, a follow-up to extraterrestrial called Interstellar, where you um, talk a lot about sort of giving kind of like uh, you know the backstory of Amu Amua and your fascination uh, with that particular phenomenon. But you also go into something that's quite fascinating to me as part of the Galileo project of trying to figure out a way to prepare technology to be ready for the next time an interstellar object uh, enters our solar system to be able to actually intercept it and take much more high definition uh, data readings, photographs, video, uh, et cetera. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah. So science is guided by evidence. And uh, what we want is to get, uh, for example, a high resolution image of the next Oumuamua, uh, we want to date it. And uh, we have an opportunity because the Vera Rubin Observatory in Chile will find more objects like it. And uh, in principle, we have also the Webb Telescope, a million miles from Earth that can look at it and pinpoint its trajectory in three dimensions because combined with telescopes on Earth, it's like having two eyes and you can uh, figure out Uh, more details about such an object, but a flyby could inform us much more. And uh, that's one aspect of the Galileo project. Another is to continue doing the expeditions of the type that I just mm -hmm. described, finding more interstellar objects like that and looking for technological debris among them. And the third one is those unidentified anomalous phenomena that the U.S. government is puzzled by. Mm -hmm. It's possible that most of them are natural objects like birds or Uh, some uh, meteors maybe uh, and uh, uh, it's the rest are balloons and drones and, and airplanes, human made objects uh, but even if one in a hundred, one in a thousand is very unusual it looks like it is technological but it's doing things that humans cannot reproduce uh, that would be extremely exciting so We uh, built uh, an observatory at Harvard University that is already operating. We are taking uh, video images of the entire sky 24-7, and we are planning to make copies of that observatory and analyze the data with artificial intelligence and, in a way, help the government figure out the nature of those anomalous phenomena and see if there is anything extraterrestrial there. So I think uh, following the method of science, we might find new things because... What uh, defines the past is people had opinions and they were arguing about opinions. But in the future, we might have data that will bring us to new knowledge and it will have a huge impact on humanity. That's what I discuss in my book. Uh, how will it tra transform humanity, bring it to a better place and change our focus from fighting each other, you know, trying to feel superior relative to each other? Because if there is a smarter kid in our class, we better, uh, you know, aspire to be like that kid, you know, learn from, from that sure. kid and, and uh, explore space, you know, just go out and check what is in our cosmic neighborhood. So I'm very hopeful, you know, that I, I believe uh, that being an optimist is uh, really a blessing because sometimes life is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Sure. Um, last question before I let you go. Um, the... The data the, um, that, that you're analyzing of the spherules, do you have any uh, a leaning on whether or not it is a natural um, element, a com combination of iron found in the solar system? Or have you, have you gotten any result of the studies of the spherules as of now? Um, I just received the materials shipped from the, uh, from the, sh um, The ship that we used right. uh, well, to home, get lost in the mail, as, right? we, as we were speaking i i heard the doorbell ring and that that was the fedex delivery person brought oh, it to wow. my home so the next uh, step is to examine it with the very best uh, instruments worldwide that we have at harvard university and uh the, as i said before the analysis will be uh, transparent the, the, the data will be open to the public so as soon as we get the results You will know. All right. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Professor. He's Dr. Avi Loeb. His new book is called uh, Interstellar, and it's coming out August 29th. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Excellent. 
Thank you so much, doctor. And hopefully you and I will be able to speak again, maybe once you learn some new data. I will be delighted. All right. Thank you very much, sir. Bye-bye. Good speaking with you.